right to go. Cool. Hey everyone, it's Nux, and it is time. It is finally time to talk about the Super Mario Brothers movie. And I don't even know what to say at this point. Like, it's been some journey to get to talking about this movie because, as you know, I've been covering the news around this movie for so long, like, all the way back to when this was announced in, like, a mere tweet from Nintendo saying, hey, we're going to work with Illumination of all companies to make a Mario movie. And ever since that day, this movie has lived in my head rent free. Now, obviously, this movie ha has had uh, moments to where it's gone quiet and we haven't hadn't really seen anything that crazy. But once things started picking up with stuff such as the crazy cast announcement, that first trailer and everything else from that point on, it, it just all kept going in motion and it's been a wild ride up to this movie it feels like an end of an era almost because this was kind of a crazy lead up point to a movie the only thing that rivals it obviously is that first sonic movie where i had to deal with that horrible first design and then the redesign stuff and uh but yeah this movie's been a wild ride and it's finally time to talk about it uh, I'm not going to say much else with this intro. I'm not going to explain, you know, why this took so long or where I've been and all that stuff because we have so much to cover. <laughs> this is going to be a full-fledged review discussion. I'm going 100% on this movie. I'm talking about as much as I possibly can in one video without y'all seeing me go crazy because I just really need to give every single bit of my thoughts on this movie because I've just been waiting for it for so long. And because there's so much I want to give my thoughts on when it comes to this movie, I'm just not going to hold back. I'm going to talk about every single thing I want to with this movie, whether it be from the uh, story, stuff like the visuals, the worlds in this film, so much more. This is going to be a big one. This is going to be a simple solo review discussion, and it's probably going to be dang near podcast length, but <laughs> it's just going to be me. So maybe some of y'all won't be able to handle that, but for those of you who can handle it. Thank you for sticking it out if you listen to every single minute of this crazy discussion. Uh, I should also say right now, I should say right now that this will delve into spoilers. Uh, I know some people are still out there dodging spoilers and I relate to that. I actually uh, got off of Twitter for an entire week, uh, for an entire week and a few extra days just so that I could dodge spoilers. Now, that's not the only reason I got off Twitter. I also want to take a little bit of a break from my mental state. Uh, because Twitter definitely does not help that. But yeah, I just wanted to make sure I went into this movie as fresh as I possibly could. And I'm very glad I made that decision because this movie definitely had some crazy surprises for me. And yeah, that's pretty much all I want to say. I got nothing else to say, so let's get into it. Let's start things off with the story summary. We'll break down this movie from plot beats, and from there, I'll give my thoughts on various things along the way. Uh, we'll touch on other categories, of course, but we'll just go over the general story summary just so that I can give a rough idea of what I was thinking as I was going through with this movie. So, let us begin. Alright, so, basically... How I went to see this movie is I waited till I could go see it with my brothers because me and my brothers are big Mario fans. I'm not the only Mario nut around these parts. Uh, my brothers specifically, we grew up obviously playing a lot of Mario games together. So I really wanted to make sure I went and saw it with um, them specifically because I felt like that would add to the experience a bit and it would make it a little more interesting just seeing it with my brothers, uh, just people who we've played Mario for so long. Like we've played so many Mario games, it's not even funny, whether it be from the mainline ones, the Mario Party series, these various sports games, and all sorts of stuff. Like Mario just has so many different games and we've played so many of them that I just figured that I really needed to see this for the first time with my brothers. That's the reason why I was so keen on dodging spoilers. Obviously if I wanted to, I could maybe like look up a, uh, 
<clears throat> a less than uh, noble means of seeing the movie first before I get spoiled. But no, I really want to make sure that theater experience with my brothers was the first experience of seeing this movie. So now that I've explained that, obviously I went and sat down and stuff like that. I didn't have any food or anything really, but <laughs> enough of that. Let's get into the story right now. So first things first is obviously the Illumination opening card. And as you would expect, we see a minion. <laughs> and <laughs> when I saw that, I was like, oh God, no, <laughs> a minion. Uh, I knew I knew it was probably going to happen because minions are obviously the big thing with Illumination. They're basically their mascot. So of course, the Illumination opening card was going to have a minion. And so this specific card specifically is just a minion in a go kart, a Mario Kart cart, with Mario Kart sound effects and taking off. And that's it. It obviously could have been way worse or way more cringe, but uh, I guess it was fine. It was passable, whatever. I'm here for the Nintendo stuff, so let's get into that. So then we see the Nintendo opening card, which is just kind of a basic like logo of Nintendo and then Mario and Luigi sprites jumping around. Not gonna lie, it's pretty underwhelming for their big movie debut opening card. Like it's literally just Mario and Luigi jumping around and then the Nintendo logo comes up and that's kind of it. Like, it wasn't really that exciting. I was expecting, like, some sort of crazy animation that, like, referenced all of their games or something like that. Like, something like the, um, MCU opening logo or, uh, what is it? The Sega one. Like, when the Sonic movies had their opening logo with the Sega thing, that was so beautiful because it had the classic Sega chant and it also showed so many games, uh, on the big screen. Like, you could see freaking Persona in theaters and that was a wild wide, but... Enough rambling about the opening card, let's get into the actual movie. So obviously this movie opens up how the first trailer did, which is the sequence of Bowser invading the Penguin Kingdom. And this gets into one of my first critiques about the movie, which is that I feel like those trailers and how much they showed with this movie kind of soiled it a bit. I'm going to be getting into this a little bit later as I talk about the movie um, more. But basically, I think that the trailer showed so much of this movie and the promotional stuff especially showed a bunch of stuff that you could kind of piece together how this movie was going to go. And this specific sequence with the penguins, like it's basically the first trailer all over again. So it wasn't nearly as exciting to watch, you know, as I when I saw that first trailer and I was just absolutely flabbergasted at the quality of this movie. So that kind of had me like, eh. But obviously there's some new stuff with uh, this sequence. And of course, the thing I got to point out immediately is we hear like this rendition of Bowser's airship theme. And like that alone gave me chills. Like, and I'm going to be saving my thoughts for music for a bit later in this review. But basically all you need to know is, whoo, the music of this movie, whoo, whoo, my ears were on fire from how fire this soundtrack could be, but I'm going to try and hold my thoughts on the soundtrack to when we get to it. But anyway, after that sequence, Bowser gets the star and then he says, who's going to stop me, obviously, or I think he, the line is slightly changed. Also, one thing I want to mention while we're talking about this opening sequence is instead of just saying open the gates, Bowser says, open the gates or die. And, and that was like, what? Like, like, whoa, like. That, that's a little intense for Bowser, but little did I know, little did I know that Bowser kind of gets a little crazy in this movie, but we'll be getting to that. But anyway, it obviously, when he says who's going to stop him, it cuts to the Mario Bros. plumbing rap commercial. Now, I'm not sure if I made a video to this prior. I'm not entirely sure if I 100% gave my thoughts to this in, in an official capacity. But basically, what you need to know is when this commercial debuted, on the internet, everyone went crazy for it because again, it is crazy to see that Nintendo referenced the Super Mario Brothers Super Show of all things. Like it was kind of foreshadowed with the some of the leaked promotional material where uh, one of the posters said plumbing is our game or something like that. But to see that they actually put the entire plumbing rat in the form of a commercial in this movie was insanity, bro. And they even have like a Mario and Luigi with little capes, which is like a reference to obviously the cape feather. And like, again, this goes back to the trailer spoiler stuff, because again, this kind of makes me wish that we saw this blind, because if I were just watching this movie and I had saw that sequence blind, I think my mind would have like broken into shambles. But because obviously 
it was like revealed on the internet and everyone was talking about it it wasn't nearly as exciting then in that moment so again that gets into one of my problems with this movie is i feel like the pre-period of this movie showed a bit too much because there's a few things that probably could have been a bit more surprising and exciting had they kept it a little more vague with the uh, trailers but anyway let's continue with the story so obviously Mario and Luigi are indeed plumbers in Brooklyn, and I love this. I love the fact that we do indeed see a bit of Mario and Luigi in their normal lives before going to the Mushroom Kingdom. And this gets into a first little tangent that I want to get into, which some people thought that this part of the movie was bizarre or non-fitting or even kind of a waste of time compared to stuff that obviously happened in the Mushroom Kingdom. And I cannot stress enough that I disagree with this heavily mario and luigi have always been stated to be plumbers from a more realistic world from like brooklyn from like earth a world very different from the mushroom kingdom there's always been kind of this two worlds lore with mario obviously stuff like with yoshi's island and some later games shook that stuff up but it's kind of always been the case that they're plumbers who originally had regular lives and i'm glad that we actually got to see a bit of those regular lives a bit of them living their plumbing job because it shows like humble beginnings before they obviously become big heroes in the mushroom kingdom it really grounds them as protagonists and you can especially feel that mario and luigi specifically have more character in this movie than ever like obviously i'm not a person who thinks mario characters have no personality like i made a whole thread of this on twitter where like obviously Mario characters aren't known for being super well in depth when it comes to like their backstories and what they do specifically, but like these characters for sure do have personality. They do have traits. It's just that obviously the, because of the stories being so simple and the presentation of the video games being so simple sometimes, we don't get to see much layers to these characters. But I feel like this movie does a good job of giving us layers to these characters and we're going to see it as I continue to break down the story. So yeah, Mario and Luigi, they're plumbers in Brooklyn. I think it's really cool. Moving on. So they're in a cafe, which is Punch-Out Cafe, and we see a bunch of portraits of um all the boxers from the Punch-Out games and that was super cool. We got to see our boy Little Mac and Doc Lewis and, and all, all those cool boxers on the big screen and I think that's crazy. There were some other Easter eggs too uh, from other Nintendo characters that we see throughout Brooklyn as well and we're going to be touching on those as we get to them like it's it's crazy the Easter egg and reference stuff that this movie does is insanity like everyone talks about it and there's a little tangent I have to talk about with that and it's not going to be what you're expecting but anyway moving along so they're in the punch out cafe that you know they're celebrating this commercial Apparently, they spent their life savings on it, which is kind of crazy. Like, that's like, what? You spent your life savings for that commercial? <laughs> okay, then. But yeah, they're really passionate about this plumbing job that they want to start up. But this gets into the next character introduction, which is the introduction of Foreman Spike. We haven't really seen him in any of the promotional material. Like, he's probably the one character who we didn't see in any of the promotional material or anything in the pre-period of this movie. And again, because of how much some of these trailers spoil, I'm actually kind of glad we didn't see Foreman Spike until the uh, final movie. So I thought that was cool. So what does Foreman Spike look like? You know, what is his role in this movie? Basically, he's this jerk uh, bully character who like comes up to the Mario Bros and makes fun of their commercial and makes fun of them and says, you're gonna be nobody's Mario Brothers, you're, you're stupid. And then he like tosses Mario and like just dips. <laughs> it's kind of funny, like he really only was in this movie to like play the role of that pessimistic character that kind of like just pushes them around. Uh, they obviously explain that, you know, he was originally their boss and Mario and Luigi worked for them in the Wrecking Crew, but then they quit to obviously start their plumbing job. And, the, and one criticism I do have is I kind of wish we saw a little more of that. Like, I feel like we should have seen them do a little bit of that Wrecking Crew job. Or maybe we should have seen them do some other jobs throughout Brooklyn before they eventually settle on their plumbing business. Like, that's one thing I was hoping for. A montage that, like, references the various different jobs Mario has had throughout the years before settling on, obviously, his most famous job, being a plumber. I thought that would have been really cool, but... Eh, 
it, it still worked, you know. But after that, we kind of just move along, which gets into a criticism that pretty much everyone and their mom has, which is that this movie moves pretty dang fast. Like, this movie moves super fast in terms of its pacing and the various story beats. And, and that's, like, probably the biggest criticism of this movie is the fact that this movie moves at like a breakneck pace and it does not slow down for nothing and while i definitely do think it's a big flaw to the movie i don't think the movie moves so fast to the point where it's like incomprehensible to understand what's going on i definitely do think that the movie is still understandable despite its fast pacing it just you know makes the story a little more simple and a little more like not as digestible compared to some other movies out there. I'm going to talk a bit more about that later, but yeah. So that obviously gets into the Mario Bros. doing one of their first plumbing jobs, and they have to, like, platform and get past some construction stuff in order to get there because they're running late. And I thought that entire sequence was really cool. They even have, like, a little World 1-1 reference during that segment, and I thought that was super dope. I thought it was super cool to see them, like, platforming already because that's obviously foreshadowing for what they're going to do later. So, yeah, all of that was great. I loved all of that. Then we get into this sequence that is probably, not going to lie, is probably one of my least favorite parts of the movie, which is them actually doing a plumbing job. Now, you would think that this isn't so bad because obviously we're seeing them plumbing, which is exactly what I wanted to see. But we spend a lot of time on this one specific plumbing job. And it's this job where Mario and Luigi just have to fix this sink from linking. And, it's, and it should be simple, right? Well, Luigi ends up stepping on this dog bone or something and ends up ticking off this dog. And the dog gets so ticked off that it just starts flat out attacking them. So for a few minutes, Mario and Luigi have to deal with, you know, obviously trying to fix this plumbing, but deal with this dog that is mindlessly attacking them. And honestly, it felt kind of random. Like, why are we spending so much time on Mario and Luigi fighting a dog? Some people say that this is, like, maybe a reference to Miyamoto getting chased by a dog, which is obviously the event that um, inspired him to create the Chain Chops. But besides that, I really don't think we needed to spend this much time on Mario and Luigi fighting a dog. Like, it's definitely a charming sequence that uh, showed their bond a little bit more. But besides that, it felt kind of like a waste of time. And it was just like a random dog, too. This dog has no significance other than it's some random person's dog that doesn't even look like it's from the Mario universe, really. It looks so Illumination that it's kind of painful. So, yeah, probably one of my least favorite scenes in the movie. I think one way they could have improved this is if they just, you know, made the dog feel more Nintendo-esque or Mario-esque so that it was a little more interesting and entertaining. For example, one solution I gave is that this dog should have been the Duck Hunt dog. And I think that would have been like a deep cut reference because if you didn't know, Duck Hunt, the original NES game, was packaged with the original Super Mario Brothers. So I think it would have been really interesting if Mario and Luigi had a bit of beef with the Duck Hunt dog, especially because um it's known to be like super annoying and it would be the type of dog that would get petty and like try to attack them and ruin their job. So I think if it had been the Duck Hunt dog, that would have made this sequence so much more interesting. But because it's just some random illumination looking dog, it just kind of felt like a waste of time, you know? All right, so after that botched plumbing job with the crazy dog, Mario and Luigi go back home to their family and this is a part of the movie that I just went absolutely insane with because one thing about the um, Mario lore that I've always wondered is like who are obviously Mario and Luigi's parents. We've seen them in games like Yoshi's Island and they've been referencing some other obscure Mario media but we've never really gotten a good look at what Mario and Luigi's family is. So what this movie decides to do is it not only reveals to us Mario's mother and father but they are living with like what I presume to be like their entire freaking family. Like there's an old man who I presume is like their grandfather or something. There's like a young kid at the table who might be like one of their cousins or potentially even another sibling. It is crazy. Like I didn't think they were going to show that many people Mario's family. And honestly, I thought it was a bit overwhelming because I think their mother and father definitely could have sufficed. But no, they wanted to go further beyond and show like their uncles 
their aunt, and it was it was a crazy stuff. <laughs> and you can definitely tell they like portrayed them as like a stereotypical Italian family too, because they're obviously like eating spaghetti or something. And Mario's dad or, or mother, I don't know, they're putting mushrooms on their <laughs> spaghetti, and it's crazy. It's crazy stuff to see Mario's family in full like that, and him just like have a moment with his family. So anyway, getting into his family, that leads into something I want to talk about, actually, which gets into Charles Martinet's cameos. Now, obviously, Charles Martinet, you know, and him not getting to be Mario was such a huge controversial thing. We're going to talk about Chris Pratt and all that later, but basically, it's through this that we kind of get an idea of what Charles Martinet's cameos are. And his first cameo was earlier in the Punch-Out Cafe where he's voicing this like random Italian guy who's like playing this Jumpman arcade machine. And he's like, oh, your accents in the commercials were perfect. Wahoo. And that one was like so on the nose. You can obviously tell it's Charles. Like the guy even looks like uh, some of Mario's old design. So yeah, that was funny, but it, it was cheesy, but it worked. I liked it. And then the other person Charles Martinet voices is Mario's father. He specifically voices Mario's father, which I found extremely interesting. And the way to portray Mario's father is he's kind of a bit pessimist himself. Like when Mario and Luigi are talking about their commercials and talking about their plumbing job, their family is kind of mocking him for it, except the mother because she supports them. But the others are kind of just like, <laughs> like, bruh, y'all are starting this plumbing company and you quit like your stable jobs for this. What are you doing, bruh? And even the dad is kind of like, bro, you don't quit a stable job just to start some crazy plumbing job. And why are you dragging your brother into this? That kind of caught me off guard. I didn't think Mario's family was going to be so pessimistic towards them, towards their um, plumbing business, especially because Mario obviously is a very optimistic guy himself. I would figure that his parents would kind of be very similar, but I guess the dad specifically just thought that him quitting his job to start this company is kind of nuts. And I can kind of understand that. I guess it makes sense. But it was kind of weird to see Mario's family just getting on him so hard like that. It's not something you'd expect from characters close to Mario and Luigi. So because Mario gets ticked off at them making fun of his uh, dream, he goes off to his room to play some video games. And this is where we get more crazy references. Mario is playing freaking Kid Icarus from the NES. And there's like all sorts of little statues in his room like an R-Wing, an F-Zero poster. And it's crazy, bro. It's crazy to see... So many other Nintendo series get Easter eggs and references throughout this movie. It's so great to see those series get acknowledged on the big screen. I thought it was great. Um, we're, again, we're going to talk about that a bit later, but yeah. Luigi comes to comfort him, and they're just kind of chilling in their room now, having a talk. And I think that moment could use a little more of a moment of silence and just a moment to, like, talk about this. But obviously, the plot keeps it a moving because... um. All of a sudden, a news broadcast is shot out where apparently Brooklyn is going through a crazy flooding problem right now. And one of the people reporting on this is freaking Pauline. We see Pauline get a cameo in this movie. It's so good that they didn't forget to acknowledge my girl Pauline. Unfortunately, I think this is all we see of her. I don't know if she shows up later again or not, but nah, this is all we see of Pauline. And I'm like, oh, they kind of did her dirty a bit with this movie because... Obviously, Pauline's whole thing is that she was Mario's original girlfriend. He saved her from Donkey Kong, and then they kind of just went off from there when Mario went from the Mushroom Kingdom. And so she became the mayor of New Donk City, and yeah, all the Odyssey shenanigans there. But unfortunately, this is really all she gets in this movie, and uh, it makes me worry that she might not get anything else in future movies because obviously... Uh, all the Donkey Kong stuff is in the Mushroom Kingdom. Like, everything they want to do with Donkey Kong and Cranky Kong is in the Mushroom Kingdom. Like, Mario hasn't met Donkey Kong and Cranky Kong. At this point, he's literally just a regular Italian-American Brooklyn guy just chilling in Brooklyn. So, yeah, Pauline kind of got done a bit uh, dirty. But anyway, obviously Mario and Luigi decide that this could be a chance to, you know, make their plumbing business more popular. Perhaps if they solve this flooding problem, it could help. So they go down to, you know, obviously investigate it. Uh, there's all sorts of little references when this happens too. But yeah, this entire sequence I also think is great. They go and check out the drain and then they get sucked into a pipe that takes them to the mushroom world. This sequence was basically perfect. It's exactly how I imagined it. 
This is exactly how I envisioned it. Then we get into obviously the split where Mario goes into the Mushroom Kingdom while Luigi goes into the Darklands. And that's going to get into something that's a bit divisive among Mario fans. But we'll talk about that a bit later. So Mario lands in the Mushroom Kingdom and he obviously meets Toad. And Toad, you know, kind of tells him a bit about the kingdom. He tells him like, oh, your brother went into that dark looking pipe. Yeah, he's in the Darklands. He might be screwed. I could help you with that though. I'll take you to the princess. And then the plot just keeps it a moving. <laughs> it, it moves so fast. Like, I kind of wish Mario talked with Toad a bit. Like, and he explained a bit more about the mushroom world there. But I thought the sequence worked fine. Like, obviously Mario sees a few enemies. He's clearly bewildered to see a talking mushroom man. Like, overall, I think that sequence still worked. I just think they definitely could have spent a bit more time, you know, just mario like relishing in the mushroom kingdom and trying to process what the heck this place is but anyway toad takes him to the main part of the mushroom kingdom with like the town with the toads and stuff like that and that's where we get that sequence to where mario is just like platforming throughout the place and the music goes full on mario and it's just beautiful that entire sequence was nothing but beauty bro and again this comes back to the trailers i wish the trailers didn't show so much of that sequence because that sequence is just so good. But that Game Awards clip like basically showed the scene as it was almost and ugh. But anyway, they get to Peach's castle and Toad tries to get him in. But the guards are obviously like, hold on, we're not letting this stranger in here, dude. Like she's in another castle and of course they had to get that reference in there. That's a classic right there. Of course they had to get that reference in and I think that was actually pretty clever. But yeah, Toad decides, you know what, I don't like this. I'm going to attack Psych. I'm going to cook for these guards. Mario go in and meet Peach. And that's obviously what he does. He goes in to meet Peach. And from there, he tries to be slick about it and like just wander through the halls. But the Toads are like, hey, who is this person? And it, that was kind of funny to me because it's like, whoa, the Toads are actually doing their jobs? That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy to see the Toads actually like identifying like strangers or people who could harm the princess and actually chasing him. That's crazy. But anyway, this gets into the scene where we get Peach's introduction. And her introduction is basically that she's obviously, you know, preparing for the fact that Bowser is getting ready to come and attack their kingdom because he just struck the penguins, he stole their power star, and he's getting ready to come over. So they're all like, all right, we need to be prepared for this. And the Toads are like, uh, yeah, that's not happening. We're Toads. We can't defend ourselves. And this gets into kind of one of my scratch with the fact that, man, the Toads, <laughs> they're pretty basic in this movie. Like, they overall make it clear that the Toads are like these adorable, like, kind of hopeless mushroom people that can't defend themselves all too well. But I kind of wish they went into a bit more about why the Toads are the way they are. Like, maybe introduce us to some different kinds of Toads. Some that are a bit more braver than others. Obviously, the main toad is the main brave toad of the species. But I kind of wish they went into a bit more into the way toads are between each other. Which is obviously a criticism we're going to get into more later. With certain creative decisions they made with the toads. But yeah. Anyway, Peach decides that the only way that they're going to beat Bowser since the toads are so helpless. Is to get another army. And they decide that they're going to contact Kongs. Because... Apparently, the Kongs have the strongest army in the Mushroom World besides Bowser, which I guess makes sense because the Kongs are pretty strong. Like, they have a lot of strong people among them. So, it makes sense that the Kongs are naturally the next set of people they go to in order to get help. But yeah, Peach decides she's going to depart soon. But as she's getting ready to depart, Mario obviously comes in and gets tackled by the Toads right in front of her. And she's like, whoa, 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 let me see this guy. And this gets into something very interesting. This is an interesting plot point that they build on a bit throughout the movie, but kind of falls off at the end. But basically, Peach gets surprised that Mario is a human, which I find fascinating. Basically, it implies that she's not really seen any other human, or if not, like many other humans. And she's kind of just shocked to see him. And I find that interesting. This is something they build up a bit later in another scene. But again, it's something that kind of falls off a bit. And I wish they kind of built on a bit more throughout the film. Because it's just such an interesting thing to Peach's backstory that gets it built on. But yeah, obviously Mario meets her. 
and their conversation about why Mario should go along with Peach to um, confront Bowser is pretty brief. It basically goes like this, like, oh, my brother is with this Bowser guy who's invading your kingdom. You got to take me with you. And she's like, I don't know. It's going to be a little scary. And he's like, nah, I'm not scared. Okay, then fine. Come along. And she decides that instead of just taking him into Bowser's territory, obviously she's going to test him. Which I think makes sense. Like, that makes sense. Obviously, she's not going to take some random guy she just met into fight Bowser. Like, because what if he, like, dies or something? Like, I see it as a way of her making sure, like, he's at least a little capable and up to the task. Which I do like. Like, some people feel like Peach was being a bit pessimist in this scene. And, like, not instantly believing him. But I can kind of see why she wasn't that, um you know, trusting of him immediately. But yeah, that obviously gets into the obstacle course scene. And this is the scene where Mario basically goes through a training montage in order to understand how to like platform and stuff like that. And this gets into another criticism I have with the movie, which is that the platforming doesn't end up amounting to too much. Like there's obviously a lot of fighting and crazy platform stuff Mario does later in the movie. So that training definitely paid off for sure. But I feel like if they had focused a little more on some of the platform throughout this movie, it would make the training montage make more sense. I also kind of wish more of the power-ups were incorporated into the training montage because then that would kind of explain a bit more about the power-ups and how wacky they can get. But they kind of just used this to just show off the super mushroom specifically, which makes sense. It's the iconic power-up. It's the one that makes uh, Mario big and like gives him his basic amount of strength. So. It makes sense that that's the one that they focus on. But yeah, Mario trains. And uh, before he trains, actually, I think Peach runs the course and she shows him how to do it. And at the end, she like does her little float move, which I think is cool. Uh, they have a talk when he finishes the obstacle course. And Peach is like, oh no, no one gets it, you know, the first time. And Mario's like, did you get it the first time? And she's like, no, yeah, I got it the first time. Which <laughs> I found a bit weird, like... You're telling me you went through all that craziness the first time you did it? I don't know about that. Like, I don't think she would have gone through that on her, like, very first time. Like, maybe it's just because she's lived in the Mushroom Kingdom and she's already used to platforming throughout the entire kingdom. And the entire kingdom is just like that. But either way, yeah, it's whatever. That's just nitpicky stuff. I almost freaking skipped over this, but I forgot to talk about, obviously, what's going on with Luigi. So, Luigi, he obviously ends up in the Darklands, which is Bowser's territory. And this entire sequence, I feel like, is basically just a big teaser for Luigi's Mansion movie. You have Luigi, obviously, you know, armed with nothing but a flashlight and kind of just being spooked by everything, bats and whatnot. Then the Dry Bones come to life, and the Dry Bones, in this specific scene are freaking terrifying like they rise from the ground they like jump from trees they chase him relentlessly through like lava and stuff it's absolutely terrifying the music especially like popped off here because you get stuff like this intense version of like the boo ghost house theme for super mario world as he's closing the door and it was crazy and then it ends with like this sort of jump scare like the shy guys and the way they were just standing behind him is just like kind of legitimately creepy like, I love that scene. I feel like that scene captured, like, the vibes of Luigi's Mansion and just Luigi as a whole so well. And again, this bumps me out with a certain thing about Luigi as we get into later in the film. But that scene was great. Anyways, so now we cut back to Bowser. What is Bowser doing now that he has the star? And this is where we get into what his plan of this film is. Because obviously, I have a lot of theories about what Bowser's specific plan was with this movie, you know, because we see him go for a star, I figured maybe his objective would be to just collect stars and obviously conquer the other kingdoms. But we have this party scene which plays uh, the Fury Bowser music, which caught me off guard because that's a bit of a newer Mario game. But yeah, as he's partying, he then begins to give a speech to his army about what he plans to do with this specific star. And no, he's not hunting multiple stars, he only wanted this specific one. And he reveals that his plan is indeed to marry Peach. So, yeah. My theory that he was just going to be this, like, conquering warmongerer and, like, maybe fall in love with Peach later. Yeah, nah, no. He already has the hots for Peach. Which I feel like is a bit of a criticism I have to give to this movie. Because 
I feel like we don't really get an explanation to why Bowser falls in love with Peach. He just kind of already is because I guess she's been this great leader of the Toads for a while. And obviously she's like this pretty princess lady. So he wants to marry her. Like you played the game, so you understand this, right? And I feel like it could have had a bit more time to like build on this. Like maybe he doesn't know who Peach is at first and he's just a conquering warmonger, but then he runs into her and he falls in love with her and then he's thirsty for her. But no, from the jump, this man is thirsty for Peach and oh boy, oh boy, that thirst is, <laughs> that thirst never calms down. Let me just put it that way. But yeah. It just adds more questions to the overall, like, premise. Like, if he just needed the one star, then, like, is that it? Like, he's already pretty powerful as is. It doesn't seem like he needs this specific star, but I guess he wanted something, like, really unique and special and powerful to, like, impress her. So that's why he specifically went with the star. And it just makes me question, like, why was the star with the penguins? And, like, why did he specifically need to find this star with the penguins like why did it have to be the penguins who were guarding this star that just makes it all the more weirder so i'm not like super bothered by it but yeah you can definitely see how that simplifies the plot a lot more than my original theory of him collecting multiple stars throughout multiple kingdoms but anyway that gets into the scene of luigi being captured and him being in prison and when he gets captured we actually get this flashback of him you know like being protected by Mario because he's obviously used to being watched over by Mario because he's the big brother like he's the brave brother he's always looked out for him it was pretty cool to see baby Mario and the baby Luigi too they even still have like the dotted eyes and everything it's kind of funny but yeah he misses Mario he gets in prison and then he gets interrogated by Bowser and the reason why he gets interrogated is he hears that there's this like mustache human it's all of a sudden traveling with Peach and he's kind of sweating because he's like wait a minute there's this human like human dude who's all of a sudden with Peach like that's weird he he like immediately gets jealous and assumes that Mario could be a threat to his potential <coughs> love life with Peach which I think is definitely a bit weird like I feel like there should have been like at least a scene where maybe he sees like Peach and Mario having a moment and that like triggers him specifically but no like right out the jump he has a fear that mario could steal <laughs> steal peach from him which is hilarious to me and then when he talks to luigi luigi definitely does not help because he like asks luigi do princesses find him attractive and he says if they have good taste which i find hilarious but yeah that leads to luigi getting locked up and we see that the penguins and some other people are locked up and that obviously reveals lumen lee and lumen lee is just kind of there being annoying and talking about death and stuff. We're going to talk about Lumily later, but yeah. So we move on along with the plot. Mario, you know, goes through the montage and stuff like that. And now he and Peach are heading to the Kong Kingdom so that they can recruit their army. Toad just kind of appears from nowhere again. And he like just tags along and he's like, hey, can I tag along? And she's like, hmm, the fact that you're a Toad and you're brave enough to tag along is kind of interesting. So sure. Some people criticize this part because Mario had to go through this whole training obstacle and montage to join Peach on this quest. But Toad, he kind of just rolls up and she lets him come. And the reason why I think it makes sense is Toad's test is just the fact that he wants to come along. Because Toads are known for obviously being super cowardly. They're not known for like stepping up to challenges like this. So the mere fact that Toad stepped up to the challenge was more than enough proof that he was worthy of coming along to her, I guess. Definitely not as in-depth as, you know, obviously Mario going through all that training, but I think it makes a little sense. But yeah, they get to the Kong Kingdom, and they montage through all sorts of other kingdoms, and I'm going to talk about those kingdoms a bit later, but yeah, those other kingdoms that we saw from the trailers, they just kind of montage through them, which I'm going to say now obviously was a bit disappointing. And I'll talk about it a bit later when we get to that part. But yeah, they get to the Kong Kingdom. And this Kong greets them and says, oh, I'll take you to our leader. And basically, they drive to the, their leader. And we see all the Kongs kind of just driving throughout the society. It seems like carts specifically seem to be a big part of the uh, Kong Kingdom, which I find very bizarre. 
Like, I'm going to talk about this a bit later, but I find it very bizarre that the cards are specifically associated with the Donkey Kong Kingdom because cards aren't really anything that's ever really been strictly associated with the Kongs. Like, we just kind of assume it's this thing that's present throughout the whole Mushroom world, but no, they make it clear that the cards are specifically a trait that belongs to the Kongs, which I find a bit weird. They never elaborate on why either. Like, I feel like one way they could have cleared this up a bit is maybe they explain that they have a lot of genius mechanics on their side, and like, the leading one is freaking Funky Kong. This could have been a chance for him to have a decent role in the story, like, where he introduces himself as the mechanics of the cards. That's nitpicky stuff, though. Let's move along with continuing the uh, plot summary. So, Mario and them may get to the Kong leader, and the leader of the Kongs is, of course, Craggy Kong. Like, we saw this through the um, trailers. He was in that weird Aztec-looking gear. And that's because, obviously, he's the leader of the Kongs. And I still don't know how to feel about that redesign of Cranky Kong. But whatever, I accept that it makes sense that he would be the king slash leader or whatever of the Kongs. Because he's always kind of had a leadership role among the other uh, Kongs. So it makes sense that he would be the one in charge for now. But he, they ask him for his army. And he says no because he's freaking Cranky Kong and he's petty like that. And Mario's like, but you're going to give us our army. I will fight for this army if I have to. And Crank Kong's like, oh, that's interesting. Okay, you fight my son, Donkey Kong. And if you win, we'll lend you our army to fight Bowser with. And I find it interesting. Like, I think this was revealed on a little tidbit on a website a little earlier. But yeah, in the movie universe, Donkey Kong is simply just the son of Cranky Kong instead of the grandson. Which is obviously a big difference because that kind of erases Donkey Kong Jr. out of existence. Like, I guess now in this canon, Donkey Kong Jr. is just Donkey Kong. And I find that extremely bizarre because for years we've always just kind of had the mindset of it was Cranky Kong was the original Donkey Kong. Then you had Donkey Kong Jr. He grew up and then he would raise his own son, which became the Donkey Kong we know and love in the um, modern Mario canon. But here, it's just kind of Cranky Kong and then Donkey Kong. Which makes sense, because really, Donkey Kong Jr. as a character just didn't really serve much of a purpose. Like, I know some people are mad at this retcon, but let's be honest. What, what death would Donkey Kong Jr. really add? I think he makes a little more sense for sure, because obviously Cranky is so old, and him just being Donkey Kong's dad straight up is weird for that, but... Other than that, it doesn't really matter. Like, the age of Kongs has always just been weird anyway. Let's get into the big next highlight, which is obviously the fight between Mario and Donkey Kong. And this fight went pretty crazy. Like, first off, it starts off crazy just by the fact that Donkey Kong comes out to the freaking DK rap. And oh my god. <laughs> Hearing the DK rap on loud theater speakers made me ascend. Like, I don't think there's ever going to be a moment in cinema history that makes me ascend than hearing the DK rap on cinema speakers, because that was crazy. <laughs> uh, shame that they didn't credit Grant Kirkhope, though. A lot of people have pointed this out, but they kind of just credited it to Donkey Kong 64, which, no, you should credit Grant Kirkhope, especially because it's the original version of the DK rap, the one with his freaking vocals in it. So he should 100% be credited, especially because they credit all the other artists too throughout this movie. So it makes no sense that he did not get credited for the DK rap. But other than that mishap, it was good to see the DK rap. Uh, but Cranky obviously tells him to turn it off and calm down. And he specifically calls out Diddy Kong for being too loud, which I find hilarious. It's so good to see Diddy Kong in this movie. Diddy Kong is one of my favorite. Uh, Mario characters, Donkey Kong characters, so it was really cool to see him get a cameo. Dixie and Chunky Kong were next to him too. I kind of wish that some other Kongs were next to them as well. Like, since they played the DK rap, why not put the other members of that crew, like Tiny Kong and, uh, who else was missing? Wanky, I think it was. Like, I think they should have, uh, snuck in a few more other Kongs too as a part of that cameo, but it was cool just to see Diddy and Dixie and them. That was really cool. Oh, yeah, Swanky. We did see Swanky. Uh, fun fact, he actually crashed 
during the part where they were on their way to Cranky Cone, he actually crashed a bit earlier. I think he freaking died, which I find hilarious. But anyway, moving along, that gets into the, like the whole fight, and obviously Mario gets whooped up at first. He tries to get power-ups to help him out, but at first it's not really working out for him because the first mushroom he gets is actually a mini mushroom. Yeah, we get mini Mario in this. He tries to run up and that doesn't really go well for him. So he powers down from that and his next approach is to try to get a fire flower, but then DK blows it out, which I find weird. Like, you can blow out fire flowers? Is that how that works? I guess so, but yeah, so we don't get Fire Mario, which is kind of weird because Fire Mario is one of his most famous power-up forms, but we never really see Mario use the Fire Flower. We actually saw um, Peach use it earlier in the field when uh, they were traveling to the Kong Kingdom, but yeah, we never really see Mario use it, which gets into something I want to talk about that I skipped over, but we'll come back to that after I analyze this whole fight thing, but yeah. This power-up that obviously changes the match in Mario's favor is the freaking cat suit. And it's kind of funny because obviously Donkey Kong laughs in it. We saw that in the trailers that he laughs at the freaking cat suit. And it's kind of funny. A lot of people are kind of going, what the heck? The cat suit is one of the best power-ups. He shouldn't be laughing. That He should be worried because that's like one of the strongest ones. Funny enough, that's the power-up he beats Donkey Kong with. Because like he has cat-like reflexes. Donkey Kong can't touch him. He's jumping all over the place, comboing him. That latter part of the fight where he has the cat suit went hard, bruh. And I, I'm actually glad that they put respect on the cat suit uh, name because it makes sense. It is one of the best power ups in Mario history. Some people were saying that the cat suit makes no sense, which I guess if you obviously don't know the games and you don't know 3D World specifically, it's kind of a weird power up. But no, it is a power up that is from the games and it makes complete sense to be in this movie and to be the power-up that he beats Donkey Kong with. But yeah, he beats Donkey Kong, and from there he wins the Kong army, so yeah. Now, I want to actually rewind, because I actually skipped the scene that I wanted to talk about. I can't believe I skipped this. I don't think I had it in my notes, but basically, during the uh, travel montage, Peach actually gives a little more of her backstory. She explains a bit of where she comes from, why she's the she's a human girl that leads these weird mushroom people. And basically what they explain is that Peach came from a warp pipe. When she was a baby, she kind of just wandered into the mushroom kingdom. She doesn't know where she comes from, who her real parents are, all of that stuff. And the toads thankfully found her and raised her into their kingdom. And because, you know, they were able to train her and she ended up being this fierce leader compared to like any other toad she just ended up becoming the princess of the kingdom which i found a bit weird i found it a bit weird that they immediately took this human child and said oh this is our princess now but considering how competent she would grow up to get i guess it makes a little sense but i do find it a bit weird and i definitely don't think it was it would be how i would make peach end up as the leader of the mushroom kingdom yeah, I definitely think that feels a bit weird and kind of contrived a bit if you don't really know the Mario games like that, but I think it's still interesting because it adds a lot of depth to Peach's story as a character. Like, we never really had anything like this when it comes to Princess Peach's background. She's just kind of always been the leader of the Toes, and we've just always kind of accepted that. But yeah, this actually adds some interesting layers, and it really makes me question, where the heck does she come from? Like, what are they setting up exactly with her wandering into the Mushroom Kingdom. Really interesting stuff. But yeah, after that madness, obviously Mario and them decide to prepare to head out and fight Bowser. You know, they hook him up with carts and stuff like that, and we get this beautiful rendition of the Mario Kart 8 uh, cart selection theme, which when I heard that in the cinemas, like, I ascended again. Like, there's so many moments where just from the music alone, I ascend it, bro. <laughs> it was beautiful, but yeah, they pick their carts out. They head on out onto this road. Uh, Donkey Kong is kind of giving Mario a bit of crap because he's salty that he got beaten, which I'm going to talk about that a bit later when I get into talking about the characters in the victory. But yeah, Mario and Donkey Kong's rivalry is kind of petty, but it's also pretty funny. It's kind of funny to see them like be frenemies basically like they're they're on the same side technically but like donkey kong is just so petty and cocky 
that it kind of clashes with Mario a bit, which I think is nice. I like I like the way they wrote Donkey Kong as a character. But now that gets into them landing on Rainbow Road, which ugh, I'm sorry, I, I gotta talk about the music again because just hearing SNES Rainbow Road in an orchestrated format as they land on it and drive was so beautiful. But again, this is another scene that I kind of wish they like slowed down and took in the moment because like I just wanted to see a little bit more of them kind of just chilling on Rainbow Road and driving on it because it's just such this iconic and like well-known track throughout Mario history and I just wanted to see a little bit more of it. You know, also, this is going to be maybe a hot take, but Personally, that scene would have hit harder if it was N64 Rainbow Road that played because that's my favorite uh, Rainbow Road because I grew up with Mario Kart 64, obviously. <laughs> like, I, I still love the SNES Rainbow Road. It's definitely okay, but I would have loved if they played N64 Rainbow Road. I think that would have resonated with so many more people. Obviously, there are people who grew up with Super Mario Kart and that in the SNES Rainbow Road, but I just love N64 Rainbow Road more. Maybe they could have, like, mixed the two and played it as they like rode through it casually. That's how I would have done it. But either way, Rainbow Road scene was kind of nice. There is this one moment on Rainbow Road where Peach asks Mario, hey, do you have like rainbows you can drive on in your world? And he's like, nah, like our world is not as crazy as yours. And she's like, what's next? You don't have evil, evil turtles? No, we have pet turtles. And like Mario in this scene, I ain't gonna lie, he being kind of smooth. <laughs> He was being kind of smooth with Peach in this in this scene because they're having a nice heartfelt moment where they're just kind of talking about the differences between the worlds and Mario's being all smooth like, hey, if you come to Brooklyn, I'll buy you a turtle, which this man, if this man don't get out of here being the Rizzler, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I got to make that joke. But yeah, even Don it gets to a point where even Donkey Kong like calls him out for it like, bro, what you doing? What you doing over here? <laughs> it's kind of, that scene is kind of funny to me. And I like how Toad specifically backs him up. Like, he, they haven't known each other for that long, but Toad really does, like, back up Mario in a lot of situations. And that's kind of funny to me. But yeah, that gets into the big Rainbow Road action scene where Bowser, you know, he learned that they were heading to them through Rainbow Road. So he's like, oh, so they want to, like, sneak up on me, huh? Well, I'm sending my army there to fight them on Rainbow Road. And then they fight on Rainbow Road. This is another sequence that I feel like I wish was a bit longer and had a little bit more action to it. Because it basically just boils down to the Kongs, you know, shooting and throwing bananas at the Koopas. Mario's, like, barely trying to, like, stay alive on the Rainbow Road. Toad, he ain't even fighting almost, kind of. He's getting kind of comboed by these Koopas. And, you know, Peach, obviously, she's kicking butt on Rainbow Road. But, yeah. I kind of wish that this Rainbow Road fight felt a little more chaotic. Kind of like how Mario Kart fights in like the battle mode feel. Like I feel like one thing they could have done is they could have maybe found a way to incorporate the Mario Kart item boxes so that way we could get a better variety of items that they throw each other and that just would have been more amusing and made it feel more naturally like a uh, Mario Kart fight. But what we got was still really cool and I actually really loved that sequence. But yeah, it ends with Mario um, getting his cart destroyed, but he manages to catch a ride with DK and they take out this one Koopa who's leading the others and it's this blue shell Koopa and everyone predicted this. The minute we saw that there was a spiky blue shell Koopa, we theorized that, yeah, this boy is probably going to be nuking someone on this Rainbow Road scene, which he does. He gets so ticked off that his cart got destroyed. He walks out of fire. He says, you can't escape me screams his name like a freaking anime attack and nukes Mario and DK off Rainbow Road. Like, he nukes them so hard, the road literally breaks. It stops the Kong army in their tracks. It was crazy. This had to be the wildest scene in the movie for me, or at least one of the wildest, but yeah. They fall into the ocean. DK gets hit by a freaking tire and knocked out kinda. And... From here, the Kong army kind of gets snatched up because they can't keep going on Rainbow Road, so the Koopas just kind of snatched them up, which I don't know about that. Like, again, they, they made a point to say that the Kong army are the strongest army in the Mushroom Road, and it makes sense because the Kongs are strong. But I feel like they kind of got a little snatched up too easily by Bowser and his goons. Like, I feel like they would have put a bit more of a fight 
which again, which I reiterate why I want to see a little more of fighting on Rainbow Road. Like, I feel like they should have had some of the Kongs we know in that sequence. Like, maybe Diddy, Dixie, and some of the others tagged along in that crew, and we could have seen them kicking a little bit of butt. And then when Bowser comes in, you know, with his army and overwhelms them, that obviously is why, how, why they get captured. But no, the Kongs just kind of get snatched up by Koopa Clown Cars, and that's kind of it for them almost. <laughs> which I find a bit weird, but yeah. Toad and Peach are the ones who manage to get out of there and get through that chaos. And they basically just book it for the Mushroom Kingdom and try to warn them that Bowser is pulling up. And, but yeah, that leaves the Mario and DK in the ocean. People presume that they're freaking dead. But no, they are alive, of course, because it's a Mario movie. <laughs> but yeah, then all of a sudden, they get eaten by the freaking Mario 64 Unagi eel. And when I saw this eel, I was like, oh no, bro, the eel, not the Unagi. <laughs> it's giving me war flashbacks. <laughs> because that thing used to kind of scare me a bit. It didn't scare me as much as the freaking crazy piano, but... Yeah, it was kind of wild seeing the Yunagi and being so huge and eat them. But yeah, that forces Peach and Toad to book it back to the Mushroom Kingdom. And they manage to get there and they tell the Toads to evacuate. And it's, it's kind of weird because obviously Peach has like Toad bodyguards and stuff like that. But they don't come with her. They just straight up run away with the other Toads. Which again, gets into a criticism I'm going to have later with the Toads in that they kind of didn't really do much with them. But the one toad who stays by her side is the main toad. And they decide, all right, we're going to confront Bowser ourselves. We're going to face him. We're going to make him back down. And all Bowser has to do is basically say, Kamek, yeah, handle toad over there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Peach, if you don't marry me, I'm killing toad. I'm killing the rest of the toads. Yeah, so do it. And yeah, she does it. <laughs> Which I kind of like that scene because it shows that obviously Peach cares a lot about the toads. And just seeing one toad, the main toad, you know, like just barely be able to stand up the Kamek made her realize, dang, I'm I'm really outmatched here. All right, I'll I'll marry you, Bowser. Which again, I feel like I kind of wish we saw the Mushroom Kingdom at least put up some kind of fight against Bowser. But it makes sense. Bowser is well, Bowser and him and Kamek and the rest of the army are OP, so it makes sense that they're gonna back down and obviously give in to the wedding eventually without Mario and them's help. But that makes us cut back to DK and Mario in the eel. And they're kind of fighting a bit because, again, they've been beefing a bit throughout up to this point in the movie. And eventually, you know, they've had enough of each other and their fight peaks. But then they kind of just stop fighting when they realize, oh, yeah, we can use this rocket here on DK's car and get out of here. Which I kind of wish that scene had a little more time to cook and we saw a little more bonding for Mario and DK. But... The scene kind of just ends with them getting out of the eel with the rocket. It's also kind of funny because I think this scene is the scene where they really do try to give a lot of character to Mario and DK. Like, we learn that the thing that they have in common is both of their fathers don't really approve of them, kind of. Like, Cranky is very harsh with DK, it seems like. He doesn't really approve of him because he's very cocky and stuff. Which makes sense because we see that during his fight with Mario. And Mario obviously has issues with his dad because you know he doesn't approve of his plumbing business and doesn't think he can make it work so they have that in common except they don't really like completely bond over that dk just kind of says well yeah your dad is right you are a joke which i'm like <laughs> this man dk is so petty bro <laughs> but yeah they get out of there and we cut back to the wedding peach is now being forced to marry bowser they're having this wedding set up and in the background, you can see various wedding gifts and guests coming along. And two special Mario bosses make a cameo during this, which is King bob -omb. And we see King Boo, which I was pretty hyped to see. I was like, hey, King bob -omb, King Boo. I kind of wish a few more enemies were in the background during that scene. Like, I feel like they could have put a few more iconic Mario enemies throughout the years in the background of that wedding scene. And it would have been really cool to maybe join in on the action when obviously the wedding goes wrong. But other than that, it was really cool to see the ones that we did see. But yeah, the wedding is moving along. Peach is getting ring the Mary Bowser. And then obviously she says, no, I'm fighting you, Bowser. Screw you. You're horrible. And he's like, oh, really? Bet. I should also mention, too, uh, before we get into this whole fight thing, uh, Bowser straight up says... Oh, those prisoners from earlier, by the way, yeah, I'm sacrificing them in your honor. 
which I found hilariously dark. Like, what? Like, I don't think in any Mario meter ever has Bowser been as sadistic as he is sometimes in this movie. From, like, threatening to kill Luigi to, like, slamming Kimmick's hands with piano keys. And like now freaking straight up sacrificing a bunch of people for a wedding? This man is insane in this movie. I'm gonna be talking about that a bit later, but yeah. <laughs> Bowser is kind of insane in this movie, but yeah. Peach rejects him, obviously, and she reveals that Toad snuck her in Ice Flower. And we see Peach use the Ice Flower to kind of fight back Bowser and some of his army. And I find that kind of interesting because, A, I don't think we've ever really seen like Ice Peach. Like, Peach is obviously even playable in so many games, it's not even funny, and maybe she's used an ice flower in some of those games, but I don't think we've seen her like power up with it and have like a different outfit change. But we do in this case, she has like this blue dress and she straight up just basically goes Elsa mode. <laughs> it's kind of funny. But yeah, she solos the Koopa army for a bit, and I kind of wish maybe like Toad got in on the action, or maybe some of the Toads came back and fought alongside her during the scene, because her just kind of soloing Bowser's army for a bit was a bit hmm I don't think she would have lasted that long but whatever she fights off the army for a bit she does this one thing to where she throws like the stick on fire and manages to light King bob -omb, and he explodes so yeah King bob -omb just freaking died he didn't even really do anything he just showed up to the wedding and was chilling he sets him on fire and boom like he explodes and like knocks out her power up and that's it for him so yeah, it was kind of sad to see that, but yeah. The prisoners are obviously still falling towards the lava, so now that she's lost her power-up, she can't really help them, but luckily DK and Mario pull up and they help out the prisoners. Mario specifically saves his brother, they have this touching reunion moment, and Luigi makes fun of him wearing the Tanuki suit, because um, while Mario and DK were up here, they have this amazing scene where they like fight through Bowser's army, and that scene was lit, bro. That's where we get like fire Donkey Kong and stuff like that, and it was really cool to see. I think it would have been cool if they like swapped between multiple power ups as they were platforming up. Like, I feel like that would have been kind of cool, but it's just kind of Mario used a basic mushroom DK, you only use the fire flower, but it's whatever. Mario gets the Tanuki suit, which it is really cool to see the Tanuki suit. Luigi says he looks like a bear, that's funny, but yeah. That gets into the climax of this scene, so. Bowser sees Mario, you know, coming back up the peach, making sure she's okay, and he's like, Ooh, this plumber guy, like, he's really trying to steal my girl. I'm sick of this crap. I'm straight up nuking the Mushroom Kingdom. And it's like, what? And he summons this giant bonsai bill, and it, like, straight up goes to nuke the Mushroom Kingdom. It's like, dang. Like, he just resorted to nuking the Mushroom Kingdom like that? That's crazy. But yeah, so from there, Mario decides, oh dang, I need to stop this thing. So he's in Tanuki, luckily, so he can fly and try and stop it. And all he manages to do is tick it off. He smacks it in the eye and it gets ticked off because obviously it's a living being. So it starts chasing him and he's like, dang, where am I going to lead this thing? And this gets into one criticism I have. He decides to lead this thing to the portal that he came from. And I'm like, wait, what? Like, why would he lead it there? Because... What if it destroys the portal and he, like, can't get back to Brooklyn? That's kind of weird. But yeah, he leads it to the portal, and I guess he was sure that it was going to absorb the bonsai build instead of exploding immediately because, well, I guess that's what it does. And it explodes halfway there, which luckily it did, because what if that, like, went back to Brooklyn? That could have, like, nuked Brooklyn. So that was definitely a bit weird, but okay then. But yeah, because it exploded... In the pathway of the portal, it messes the warp pipe system, and that obviously sucks in Bowser's castle. And this was weird. Like, I figured maybe it would, like, suck in some of them. But no, it sucks in, like, a huge portions of the Koopa army. It sucks in all of our main heroes. And the final showdown of this movie happens in Brooklyn. And this was bizarre to me. Like, I did not think the final battle was going to happen in Brooklyn. I figured it would be a typical Mario showdown in Bowser's castle on the Lava Land, but no. They land in Brooklyn, like parts of Bowser's castle fall in Brooklyn. It's like straight up messing up like the city and stuff like that. Like, this looks like a freaking Avengers movie at this point. <laughs> it's kind of hilarious. So I can see how some people see that as bizarre, 
But I guess it makes a little sense because technically we're ending the movie back where we started. You know, we started in Brooklyn and it kind of makes sense to come back around the Brooklyn, but it is definitely weird to have a Mario final battle in this weird city-like place instead of where we typically see Mario final battles, which is in Bowser's castle. So that's definitely weird. But yeah, they fight Bowser in the streets of Brooklyn for a bit, but Mario specifically is getting pretty messed up. Like Bowser is straight up comboing Mario. He's getting bruised up and everything. He's taking some heavy hits from him. So he decides to like hide it out for a bit because like he's getting whooped by Bowser, absolutely. And Bowser's like, hey bruh, are you gonna run run the fade? What's what's going on in there? Why are you hiding? Why are you hiding? And his friends don't like that, so they try to fight Bowser, but then he whoops them too. Like he just straight backhands them in one hit. Also, fun detail there, he does the classic Bowser roar there, which I found cool. But yeah, Mario, he's in his feelings now because he got whooped by Bowser. But then he sees him and Luigi's commercial again, and that inspires him to get back out there and be a hero. Like, that commercial, you know, it reminds him what he's fighting for, you know, what he wants to do. And so he gets back out there to face Bowser. And obviously, if he just faced Bowser as he was, he probably wouldn't stand a chance. But luckily, Peach manages to knock out a Koopa and kick a shell to the star because at this point, Bowser still has the star and he could use it to destroy Brooklyn or the Mushroom Kingdom at any point, but he doesn't really think to use it. And that's kind of a little bit of a plot hole because he could have theoretically used the star at any point, but I guess he figured he didn't need it because no one at this point in the movie matched him. Like, no matter what power anyone had, they just couldn't step up to him because he was just such an absolute unit. But he forgets about the star and Peach takes the opportunity to kick it to Mario in them. Mario rushes for it, but Bowser breathes fire near him and it almost burns him alive. But luckily, our boy Luigi, he finally gets another W after basically going missing for half the freaking movie. He gets a W and manages to block out Bowser's fire, helps Mario get the star with him, and they both become star form. And oh man, this scene... Let me tell you, I, this scene was the best scene in the movie, hands down, hands down. Like the other scenes in the movie definitely were like lit for sure in some in certain ways, but I feel like this is the one scene in the movie where I just forgot everything around me. I forgot all my criticisms. I just and I just became a pure Mario nerd. Like hearing that orchestrated star theme blaring in the cinema speakers as Mario like just plow through these enemies destroy their hammers and stuff like that and just go crazy on Bowser. They were going crazy on this boy Bowser. They were hitting him with straight up SMB Z combos, straight up Mario and Luigi Alpha Dream combos. It was beautiful. Probably one of the most beautiful themes I've ever seen in a cinema. Call me what you want. Call me a Mario fanboy who just easily eats up that stuff, but I couldn't help it, man. It was just such a purely fun Mario scene and I just couldn't help but have a huge dorky smile on my face all throughout it. But anyway, they beat Bowser, and that's the end of that. So how they decide to finish off Bowser is Peach comes in with a mini mushroom, which I don't know where the heck she got that, but she gets a mini mushroom and she stuffs it in his mouth. And now he's a tiny boy, just like how Mario was earlier, and they stuff him in a jar. Which, oh god, not the jar. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to do that joke. But anyway, they stuff old boy Bowser in a jar, and he's no longer a threat, I guess, you know? Everyone comes up and cheers for them for saving Brooklyn from all these crazy enemies and stuff like that. I guess Bowser's army dips after that, because obviously they got whooped up. But yeah, it's definitely kind of a bizarre ending, because we ended things off in Brooklyn, and there are crazy turtles and, like, a giant monkeys in the streets. So, like, is no one, like, worried about that? Like, even Mario's mom and dad, you know, they run up to obviously check on them and like cheer them on for like winning out in the end and surviving but like bro how do you not notice like the giant ape and, and the weird mushroom man standing there like it's kind of weird but yeah they obviously do the typical end of movie pose together and the movie kind of just ends there like from there we get a shot of mario and luigi back in the mushroom kingdom and the movie basically ends there and this gets into probably one of my bigger criticisms and probably where I feel like the fast pace of the movie hurt it the most because the movie feels like it basically kind of comes to an abrupt end there like we don't get the scene explaining why Mario and Luigi are back in the Mushroom Kingdom like why are they chilling there instead of staying back in Brooklyn 
that's kind of weird. Like, we don't really get an explanation for that. We don't know what happened with, like, the Penguin King and stuff like that. Did they manage to make it out okay? I guess so, since DK stopped the sacrificing machine, you know? Like, we could have had a scene with Donkey Kong chilling again with his folks and having a moment with them, another moment with Mario and Peach, but nope. The film kind of just abruptly ends. So if I had to have one major criticism to where I think the fast pace hurt it the most, it would definitely be this ending because it feels very abrupt. Like, I feel like there's definitely some stuff they could have fleshed out to, you know, really make this movie feel whole. But either way, it, it still worked, I guess. I still really love the movie up to that point. I thought it was still a fun satisfying sequence and from there we get the credits which i think the credits were just kind of basic i kind of wanted them to do some cool animation stuff but the credits are just kind of basic i feel like they could have done something cooler with the credits i don't know man they should do something cooler next time also fun fact we see iwata's name there which it's always touching to see iwata's name in the credits of nintendo stuff even to this day bro some people say that that makes no sense because obviously iwata passed away years ago by now surely he didn't have a hand on this movie but it makes sense because he basically is the one that announced that this project was happening he's the one that helped get this project off the ground so it makes sense his name is in the credits like some people doubt that but nah i think he deserved his name in the credits of this movie but yeah so that's the end of the story summary basically but hold on there's a mid credit scene and a post credit scene and what are they? A bit of a waste of time if you ask me, because the mid credit scene is basically just Bowser singing again like he did early in the film, and we're going to talk about Bowser singing in a bit, but I feel like it was kind of dumb to waste the mid credit scene on yet another Bowser Sings gag, because eh, like they could have used that to do something really interesting, like tease a character that would be in a future movie or something like that, or elaborate more on the ending or something i don't know i felt like that was a bit of a waste and then that gets into the post credit which does give us a new character reveal but it's just freaking yoshi hatching out of a yoshi egg which i feel like this was such a waste especially because yoshi is so basic and predictable like no duh yoshi is probably gonna be in the mario movie sequel and have a bigger role it's a freaking yoshi like dang it miyamoto like i know you like this green dinosaur but come on couldn't think of anything else more interesting. Some people say it's apparently a Godzilla reference, which is cool, I guess. But, I don't know, it's still pretty disappointing and basic. I was hoping we'd get a little more of an interesting tease for a character in the sequel. Like, I don't know, Bowser Jr., Warrior and Waluigi, even freaking Daisy, or something, bro. But, Yoshi just feels basic and predictable. It especially didn't help the fact that we already technically saw Yoshi's. We literally saw them past Yoshi's Island during the traveling montage, so I don't know. It just wasn't all too surprising to see Yoshi at that point, but whatever. That's the whole story broken down, so now this gets into me giving my final thoughts on the movie, and this is where I really start to review this movie and break down the various points about it and overall what I think about it. So basically, Obviously, a lot of people criticized this story, especially the critics. They were going in on this story. I don't even need to get into that. But basically, yes, the story is indeed predictable and simple. Which it is, but obviously, because it's a Mario movie, that makes sense. And even though the story is predictable and simple, especially because it basically just amounts to another Bowser bad Mario, you know, help out Peach in the Mushroom Kingdom type of story. What helps this movie a lot is that it has a lot of unique scenarios, a lot of interesting character developments that's not present in the Mario games. And I feel like for that alone, it makes it a much more unique experience compared to, you know, your average Mario game. Yes, the movie is very fast paced and it needed more time to flesh out certain scenes and certain elements of the overall movie, but I just feel like, you know, even in the basic form that this movie is in, it still worked very well. And some people exaggerate the fast paced thing because in some scenes of this movie, it does take, you know, a few seconds to like really breathe and go over some stuff. But obviously it still moves along pretty dang fast. So 
it still hurts this movie a little bit. So I definitely do think this movie should have been longer and they should have expanded on some certain stuff when it came to the story. Next, obviously, is the trailer spoilers. I talked about this a little earlier in the video, but basically I think this movie was really hurt by how much the trailers revealed. Like the entire opening of the movie was the first trailer. And I think in hindsight, that wasn't very smart to do. They should have cut it up a bit so that we just saw glimpses of that opening sequence and we didn't basically see the whole opening sequence. But yeah, other than that, it wasn't too bad. There was still plenty of new stuff that this movie had, but I definitely do think that the trailers revealing so much kind of hurt the movie and overall added to the fact of it being more predictable and simple than I would have liked. Also, some people state that the movie just straight up has no structure to it, but I disagree with that. The movie very much has specific objectives and specific things in mind with how its story progresses. Like, the core of the movie, obviously, is Mario rescuing Luigi. Their brotherhood and their friendship, if you will, just overall is the core of this movie. And Mario, obviously, losing his brother makes him want to get him by any means necessary. So he teams up with Peach. But obviously they're not the strongest people so they go to recruit the Kongs and now they go to fight Bowser and get Luigi back and that's basically how the movie progresses. I don't think it's as broken as a story as people claim. I just feel like because it's so simple and basic and not all that twisty of a story it makes some people upset. But for a Mario movie, especially in a Mario story, I think that this is very unique and very much worth the watch. Next, let's talk about the visuals and presentation, and this is where I don't have too many negatives to say because this movie is pure eye candy. It captures the colorful and energetic energy of the Mario universe so well. Like, this movie is animated so great, and that's surprising to say because obviously, you know, being an Illumination movie, people had a lot of doubts about that and all sorts of other areas when it came to the film. But in the end, the movie ended up just looking really great. Now, there were a few areas that I had some issues with. For starters, Peach. Like, sometimes she could look a bit off in certain scenes. But other times, she's okay and fine and looks like Peach. But yeah, I think that they struggled a bit in, like, translating her over into this realistic style, especially. She's probably the character who looks off the most. The other characters look mostly fine for the most part. Next, I also want to criticize King Boo. Like, this is gonna be kind of random, but... Bro, I really hate that they use the basic King Boo design, and even then, he looks really off. Like, King Boo looks extremely off. Like, his proportions are just weird. He's more oval-shaped than round-shaped, and in general, like, they need to fix up his design, especially if we do get, like, that Luigi's Mansion movie and stuff like that. Please fix it, King Boo's design. But other than that, and Peach looking off sometimes, Visuals and presentation were god tier. And then we had like easter eggs in like every frame, every little corner and stuff like that. And this gets into a little tangent I want to get on, which is the fact that people complain that this movie relies too much on references and easter eggs. But my response to that is simply that, like, I can understand critiquing like the easter eggs being a bit much in certain areas. And sometimes I could see how relying too much on established Mario canon was a bit much. But some of these easter eggs are not like things that they threw in for like member berries or like nostalgia points. I think some of these things legitimately fit in the Mario universe. Like people complaining about specific power-ups or specific characters showing up in places they'd make sense to be in is dumb. Like critics were going crazy about this and I just think it's dumb. Like I could go on and on about why it's so stupid that this film doesn't entirely rely on nostalgia and easter eggs for its content these things are just naturally a part of the modern universe but we'd be here all day i don't feel like ranting about something that should be freaking obvious so let's move along to the next part all right next let's talk about the world setup of this movie so obviously this movie definitely goes back to the whole two worlds thing where we have a real kind of normal world and then we just kind of have the mushroom world which is this crazy world with all sorts of other subparts of it and I definitely like this but one criticism I do have for this movie definitely is the fact that I wish we saw a little more variety in the mushroom world obviously we see a good bit of Mario and Luigi you know in Brooklyn 
And it makes sense they didn't delve too much more into that because we know what New York City is like. No one wants to watch a Mario movie to see them chill in the world, even though it would have been nice to see a few more things there. Obviously, we needed to get to the Mushroom World, but when we get to the Mushroom World, we do spend some time in like the Mushroom Kingdom, and we spend a lot of time in the Kong Kingdom and stuff like that. We see a lot of Bowser's Kingdom and stuff what, but we don't see much of some of these other kingdoms that they just kind of montage through, like the Desert and the Canyon looking kingdom and the Chief Chief Bridge. They just kind of like pass by that so fast and it's kind of disappointing because I really want to see more of those places. Like people were hyping up those locations, but it turns out we don't see much of them. Like I think it would have been really cool if we actually stopped and breathed in an area like Yoshi's Island for a bit, but they just kind of pass it by it in a quick glimpse. So yeah, that's probably one of my biggest issues with the uh, world setup of this movie. It makes me wish that my original theory of Mario and Code traveling between multiple kingdoms to recruit them to fight Bowser was true because I think it would be more interesting if they were trying to get the help of multiple kingdoms to fight against Bowser and we spent a little more time in specific locations but considering how fast paced this movie was as is it kind of makes sense they went for the structure that they did because if we you know had to cram in those other kingdoms in this slow runtime things would have been really like tight so i understand why the movie was formatted the way it was but i don't know man i kind of wish we saw a little more of the mushroom world and some of the other kingdoms that we saw definitely would have been more interesting but yeah that's what i think of the world setup next let's get into the specific characters and the various different elements about them i'll also be touching on their voice acting because obviously the voice acting was <laughs> a big controversial thing with this movie but yeah what do I think about the various characters and their performances and stuff like that I'm gonna try and breeze through this as fast as I can first we obviously have Mario Mario is probably one of the best written characters of this movie because this movie really does succeed in actually making clear how Mario as a character is yes he's the basic you know hero type of character you would expect Mario to be but he has layers in this like He's very short patient sometimes, like with Donkey Kong and stuff like that. He has little nitpicks, like he dislikes mushrooms, which I found that weird. Like, Mario hates mushrooms? The guy who's like known for eating mushrooms, they make him hate mushrooms? I don't know about that. That's a bit of too weird of a change. I would personally have to where maybe he does like mushrooms, but maybe he just doesn't like the way the mushroom world mushrooms look. I don't know about that, but yeah, Mario's development in this movie was a great I love the way they wrote him and as for Chris Pratt oh boy what do I think about Chris Pratt he was okay he wasn't as bad as I thought he was gonna be like at a certain point he just kind of worked as Mario for me he obviously wasn't perfect and he didn't live up to capturing the energy of the high pitch Italian Mario we all know and love. but he worked as Mario for this film. He did an alright job. He wasn't as terrible as everyone thought he was going to be. And yeah, that's just kind of my thoughts on Mario. He just was okay. I didn't think he was terrible. I didn't think he was the most amazing portrayal of Mario ever. I just thought he was odd. So yeah, that's my thoughts on Mario. Next, let's get into Luigi. And oh, Luigi, bro. <sighs> Luigi, Luigi, Luigi. What we got of Luigi was amazing like I think he's easily one of the best characters in the movie and that's great because Luigi is one of my favorite Mario characters but the obvious elephant in the room is that he just was done dirty by this movie like yeah he did a lot in the beginning he even had that cool dark world part and his dynamic with characters like Bowser and stuff is cool but once he gets thrown in that cage he basically disappears from the plot like for the entire like second act almost he is gone and it just sucks because I would have liked to see more of Luigi. I feel like he just did not get much opportunity to shine in this movie. Some people had theories that he would have had like a prison break subplot with the Penguin King and some of the other characters. But no, he's just kind of gone for so much of the movie. And I definitely do think that hurt the movie a bit. I also wish we could have seen a little more unique traits from him. Such as like his high jump and his kicking legs and stuff like that. And... Overall, I just wish we got more Luigi in this movie. I guess what we got managed to work, especially because they included him in the final battle, which I am grateful for. I'm grateful that they added him to that final battle. It's so funny because 
I literally predicted how that final battle was going to go. I figured Mario would hit the star, he would beat up Bowser with it, and he'd even swing him by his tail. I knew he would do that. But the fact they let Luigi in on that action definitely helped it. But it would have been more impactful if, you know, we saw Luigi do a bit more in this story. Like him helping on the final battle just kind of felt like a last minute bone. So yeah, hopefully in the sequel they give Luigi more love. I loved him in this movie, but he just got done a bit too dirty. Next, let's get into another character that's controversial with how they were handled in this movie. Princess Peach. And... <sighs> Let me just say now that talking about Illumination Mario Movie Peach is just so exhausting for me at this point. Like, every other week on my YouTube feed, or through countless passing comments around this movie, it's always... Oh, Princess Peach is woke in this movie. She's a Mary Sue that is the real main character. And blah freaking blah. Between comments on my own videos and having to deal with this every time I want to just casually talk about this movie, I am so sick of it. But it's whatever. Just to make sure I am as clear as I can possibly be with my thoughts on Peach, I've re-recorded my thoughts on her and scripted them for this section, but it still requires you actually listening to understand, so please do so. So what do I think about Peach? Basically, I just think that her portrayal in this movie is okay. Not bad at all personally, but not exactly the way I would personally like Peach to be portrayed for this movie. For starters, I can't stress enough that I do enjoy that she has a more active role in the story and isn't the completely helpless damsel that she is in the mainline video games, as it was long overdue to treat her better and anyone who disagrees with that basic idea doesn't understand her character in my eyes. Because she does not have to be helpless. She has worked alongside Mario and defended herself so many times in the games. It is not an exaggeration. So that is not remotely the issue. The issue is that many people feel that they overcorrected her personality and story role in a not so natural feeling way for the sake that she doesn't look too weak and stereotypically helpless. And in some ways, I can see why as it's clear that they lean her hard into the fierce, competent leader type without keeping traits of Peach that actually make her who she is. Peach is a character not afraid to embrace a cutesy and dainty typical princess attitude. She just knows that sometimes she has to break out of that for the sake of her kingdom. And I feel like that's the balance movie Peach should have had in my eyes. That being said though, I don't think Movie Peach ended up as far from video game Peach as people think still, as she's still very much caring and nice to others as she always has been, which is shown strongly with multiple dynamics such as the growing one between her and Mario, you know, between how she always tries to compliment him or encourage him in fights and stuff like that. Like, Mario and Peach in this movie have great chemistry. And again, our boy Mario was being kind of smooth sometimes, and I know she was feeling it too. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that because I'm not a shipper, but yeah. I feel like it's even more obvious with stuff like her giving herself up to Bowser for the safety of the Toads. And just with stuff like that alone, people who say Peach doesn't have any layers of those to her, like at that point, they're just watching the movie with their eyes closed. And it's why discussing her character in this movie is so frustrating. Yes, she's not perfectly portrayed in my eyes, but she very much still feels like Princess Peach. And they even give her some interesting new layers through her backstory of how she became the princess, which granted, it's clear they are kind of vague on it for potentially sequel baiting stuff, but it still is interesting character work. And also, the claims that she does everything are false, 
when you have moments like her, you know, losing her ice powers and needing Mario and Donkey Kong's help. Or in the finale where she tries to fight back against Bowser, but still ends up getting, you know, held back by the Koopas a bit. And mainly is just there to support Mario. Like, again, people are watching this movie with their eyes closed if they think that Peach is this uh, Mary Sue girl boss character who, like, eats up the spotlight from every other character because that's just straight up false. But yeah, I'm done with Princess Peach ranting. I'm more of a Princess Daisy fan anyway, so I'm moving on. Next, let's get into Bowser, which y'all already know. I think Bowser was also easily one of the best characters of this movie. Jack Black went crazy with his portrayal of Bowser. He nailed that goofy and intimidating side of the character so perfectly. Uh, speaking of that, uh, Charlie Day and Anya Taylor-Joy, I, I forgot to comment on them, but yeah, they did uh, good too, as well as the characterizations. But back to Jack Black, because that's what really matters. <laughs> he was great. Now, one of my issues with Jack Black's, uh, or Bowser's <laughs> character in this movie is I do feel like they leaned a bit too much on his whole simping for Peach thing because sometimes it could definitely get a bit much. Like, obviously, the big thing a part of this is he has two musical numbers about Peach. Like, he's playing on the piano and he's, like, riffing in the song and it's like, bruh, does he really need to go this hard for Peach? Like, and again, we don't really get context of why he's crushing over Peach so hard. We don't get a moment where he sees her in action for the first time, so... That just makes it feel even more bizarre a little bit. But other than that, I feel like they portrayed Bowser near perfectly. You know, they nailed his intimidating side really well. Like, he's pretty fierce in this movie. Again, he does some crazy stuff in this movie. And they captured his goofy side well through his simping with Peach. So yeah, I liked Bowser's characterization. Next we get to some of the other characters, and unfortunately, outside of the big four there, the other characters kind of lack a bit of character development. Let's talk about Toad. So Toad, in the beginning, it kind of feels like they have a bit of an arc with him in mind, where he's a Toad different than the others because he's braver than the average Toad, but they don't really build on this, because throughout the scenes, Toad is kind of just acts how you'd expect Toad to act. He's scared in a lot of moments and not often very brave um so it kind of goes against the whole point of setting up that he's a braver than average toad they don't really give toad much to do he has his moments like again sneaking peach that ice flower and i guess willing to stand by her side instead of running away with the other toads but in general i just feel like they could have done a bit more with toad as a character but what's even more underutilized is the toad species as a whole, because I just think that they just kind of existed to fill up the Mushroom Kingdom, and they didn't do a good job of making the toads feel like a distinct people. And y'all already know, I hate the fact that all the toads look very similar, and I hate, hate that they cut out Toadsworth, bro. Like, Toadsworth should have been in this movie, no excuses. I feel like he could have been such a good character to represent the toad species because we have this toad that has this deep personal connection to Peach and represents the toad people. Like maybe Tozer could have been the one specifically who found and took in Peach. And obviously because he cares about her so much and he raised her to be this uh, well-knowing leader, like he'd explain a little more about her character and in turn explain a little more about the toads. But because the toads are just kind of these blank slate of a species Peach rules over, it just hurts them a lot. And I just hate the fact that they took out Toadsworth because just his inclusion alone could have helped. Like, and where the heck was Toad at? Like, come on now. Like, I, I feel like they could have done a bit more with the Toads. But yeah, what we got was fine, I guess. Donkey Kong, he was also all right. They definitely did some interesting stuff with him because obviously you had the stuff with him bonding with Mario over the fact that they don't get along with their dads. There's the fact that he's super cocky and butthurt that he lost to Mario. And he doesn't respect him until Mario obviously saves his life. And that's about it. They don't really build on that though. Like, there's this one part where he has an outburst that he's not a smashed monkey. But it's never really 
really built up to or ever elaborated on again. So yeah, Donkey Kong was just kind of there. He's just kind of this funny brute rival character that Mario just butts heads with for a bit until the end. So I definitely wish they could have done more with him as well. And the same applies, I guess, kind of with the Kongs, but to a lesser extent. I definitely think they did a better job fleshing out the Kongs because there's a lot more unique Kongs that help distinguish them out. Like we get to see Diddy Kong, we get to see, you know, Cranky be a leader and obviously we have Donkey Kong in them. So it helped make the Kongs feel a bit more fleshed out than the Toads and weirdly. Like, and obviously because they're like the strong kingdom with cards and all that stuff, they're just not that easy to forget. So yeah, the Kongs just overall were portrayed really well. There's definitely areas I think they could have done better. Like again, we could have maybe had Funky to explain why they're so cart centric in their culture, if you will. And I kind of wish we saw Diddy and Dixie and them do a bit more. But overall, I thought the Kongs were portrayed well. Um, in terms of voice, Cranky definitely sounded off, like he definitely could have sounded older, but I guess the way we got Cranky was fine. And in terms of Donkey Kong, well, <laughs> he was basically Seth Rogen, and that's all I'm going to say on that. Oh, I also forgot to comment on Toad in terms of voice. He was good. Uh, he's actually kind of better than the game voice Toad because he's not annoying, like his voice wasn't grating. So yeah, I thought he was good in that area too. Now let's move along to Kamek and the other Koopa Troop minions, which overall, I just felt like Bowser's army was portrayed mostly great. Like, I just think they were handled perfectly. Like, Kamek obviously is the loyal right-hand servant to Bowser. He does things that you'd expect Kamek to, like even helping him practice for when he proposes to Peach, like that's such a Kamek thing to do. And there's all sorts of little funny moments with Bowser's minions too, like that one Koopa Troop who like asks Bowser what happens if Peach says no and then Bowser sits in the fire. <laughs> that moment was crazy, bro. But yeah, in general, I'm glad that Bowser's army was portrayed pretty well. Like in a way, my only nitpick is I kind of wish we saw a few other enemies. Like weirdly, Lakitu was missing. Like I think we got most of the basic Mario enemies except Lakitu. It was a weird absence in this movie. But other than that, the enemies were portrayed extremely well. The Blue Shell Koopa in particular, he's the MVP because I still can't get over how much of a hater he was. I still can't get over how crazy he went just to try and stop Mario from getting to the end of Rainbow Road. It was crazy. But yeah, Bowser's army and Kamek were portrayed well. Uh, Kevin Michael Richardson did a good job with Kamek. Whoever voiced the other enemies did good as well. Fun stuff. So... I guess from there, all we really got to talk about is minor characters such as Foreman Spike, which, eh, he filled his role. I kind of wish we saw a little more of him again with seeing the Wrecking Crew stuff, but he worked. His redesign was kind of weird because it felt a bit generic from his other designs. I kind of wish they went with some one of his other designs in terms of redesigning him in a modern way, because here he just kind of looks like freaking Keemstar. <laughs> But other than that, he was fine. Again, I wish we saw more Pauline. The Penguin King, he was fine. But again, like, where did he go at the end? <laughs> and then we get to Lumily. And Lumily is interesting because Lumily is a character not a lot of people like because they feel he was pointless. All he did was basically, like, annoy the prisoners in their cages as they were waiting, you know, for some kind of way out. That's literally all he did. We never get an explanation to who Lumily is, where he comes from, why is he imprisoned by Bowser, why is he bugging them? There's no context to Lumily, and I feel like that's what makes him feel pointless because he literally just exists to kind of just be this comedic slash like annoying character. There's no depth to Lumily, and I feel like that's what kind of made the post credit scene even more annoying because. I figured that if they were going to have a Luma in this movie, they got to have some kind of Mario Galaxy reference outside of that, right? But other than like Mario Galaxy cues in the music, they don't do anything with Luma Lee or the fact that there's a Luma here. So yeah, it's definitely extremely bizarre. He needed a little more context. But yeah, that's pretty much all I got to say on Luma Lee. And then obviously we have the Charles Martinet cameos, which he was just perfect. It was really good to see Charles Martinet in this movie. 
Good stuff. Next, let's talk about the music. Obviously, I was gushing about it throughout the story summary, but oh yeah, this OST is lit. Like, I don't even think I have to explain why. But basically, this movie not only uses so much music from the actual Mario video games and just mixes them with this beautiful orchestrated cinema sound, but the way that it uses so many different songs in so many different moments throughout the film is just so beautiful. Like, this easily has to be the best video game movie soundtrack without question. Like, while I do think that there are some movies and even some video game movies that handle certain things about their structure a bit better, the way that this movie handled music is just beautiful. Like, you can tell that people who are actually passionate about Mario music worked on the OST of this movie, and it was amazing. Like, I don't want to sit here and go over all the specific songs, but all you need to know is the fact that they pay tribute to so much Mario music is easily one of the best things about this movie. However, the OST is obviously not perfect, and I'll get into that in a moment, but before I do, I also want to mention some other small things about the music, such as the fact that um, we actually get some songs from the actual games, like, unedited. Like, I talked about the DK rap earlier, but we also get, like, the Bowser's Fury theme, which I think is cool, because, again, that's, like, a recent Mario theme, so it was cool to hear it in the theaters, especially since it's this intense metal song, so crazy stuff. But now, let's get into where I think that this OST falters a bit, and obviously, people talk about this, but the big problem with this OST is the fact that Yes, they do have mainstream songs in this movie. This was probably one of the biggest fears for this movie leading up to the release of it because obviously people didn't want to hear like cringe, unfitting mainstream music in the Mario movie. But well, there are a few mainstream songs in this movie and let's go over them. So basically what they do is they sprinkle them in here and there. Like it's not too frequent to the point to where it's obnoxious with something like, I don't know, like Suicide Squad from DC or something, but there's definitely some cases that are like bizarre. For example, they play Take On Me during that part where Mario and Co are driving towards Cranky Kong, which is just very bizarre because it just doesn't really fit the scene itself and overall just doesn't feel fitting to Mario. It's kind of funny to me because Take On Me is actually one of my favorite songs of all time, and I remember some Mario animations that use that song, so it's kind of funny in that sense. But otherwise, it didn't really feel too fitting. They played I Need a Hero during uh, Mario's little training montage, which it's an 80s song that's often used for training montages, so I get it. But like, that specific song is just so overused in so many different movies at this point that I feel like they really didn't need to include it because it just didn't feel special or make the scene feel more impactful. And then probably one of the most bizarre ones to me is they played Thunderstruck during the part where they're building their carts. And I'm like, why though? Like, you had this beautiful rendition of the Mario Kart selection theme that they used in the actual OST, but then they just kind of play Thunderstruck, which is just bizarre because again, so many other movies have used that specific song. They didn't really need to play Thunderstruck, but I guess so. And probably the most unnecessary one, they played Mr. Blue Sky at like the very end, like the very end of the movie. They didn't even need to use that one. Like the movie is literally over. Do we really need to play another mainstream song when we're like basically at the end? It is bizarre like how many mainstream songs are just kind of crammed in here as if they really needed to stuff some type of Western mainstream representation. It gets to a point where it kind of feels a little obnoxious, but I feel like what makes it super obnoxious is the fact that these mainstream songs actually replace songs that are in the OST. Like, if you didn't know, in the OST, in the full OST, there were actually regular orchestrated songs that were meant to play in some of these sections. Like that DK driving part, they actually had a song dedicated to it that even had the uh, DK theme from the Donkey Kong Country games, but it was cut out so they could play Take On Me. So I feel like that's especially what makes these mainstream songs a bit of a crime. Like, they're not super offensive because, thankfully, they're iconic 80s songs that aren't really that annoying. Like, thankfully, they're older songs that are iconic and not that bothering. But the fact that they're just so overused in so many other movies still makes it annoying. But I definitely prefer that to if they would have played, like, 
I don't know, I Spice or like some SoundCloud rapper's music in the movie, I think I would have died. But I don't know, man. Like, I definitely think there should have been like at least maybe just one or two and they should have just kept the songs that they specifically composed for the freaking movie. It just feels super disrespectful to cut good music from this movie just to play overused songs. I will say the one song that I was okay with was the uh, No Sleep Till Brooklyn one and I feel like that one was actually super fitting because obviously Mario and Luigi are still in the real world aka uh, New York, Brooklyn at that point. So uh, it fit, you know, they are in Brooklyn uh, and they are in the real world. So that one was kind of okay. That's the one mainstream song I probably would have kept and if I had to keep another, uh, I guess Mr. Blue Sky because it's at the very end and it doesn't cut other songs that obviously had more time and effort put into them. But yeah, I definitely think they need to learn to cut back on the mainstream music. And I feel like what especially shows how bad these mainstream music mandates are is the fact that they nearly cut the final battle music for mainstream music. Like apparently they were supposed to play a uh, Van Helsing's Jump instead of the Superstar theme, which who was going to make that decision? Like. Are you actually brain dead? Like, I try super hard not to insult people, but if you actually thought that playing some overused mainstream song would be more fitting than playing that beautiful orchestrated superstar theme, you are actually a dumbass. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'll calm down from that. But yeah, other than that, I really did enjoy the OST. Oh yeah, I guess there is Jack Black songs. I touched on them earlier, but yeah, Jack Black has some songs where he's obviously singing about Peach, and I thought they were kind of funny, but obviously, it's not something I'm gonna like listen to casually. It's funny in the moment, but eh. And I especially think that song kind of overstated Welcome when it came back in the mid credits, because obviously I think the mid credits should have been something more interesting. But yeah, that's my take on the music. The OST is great, and that's it there. Next, that gets us into the tone and comedy and this is something that is very divisive among people because one argument I've seen is people saying that this movie feels a bit too childish, a bit too lighthearted, and this is where I'm gonna rant, this is where I'm gonna pop off, oh god my throat is killing me but I gotta pop off for this. While I understand why this movie's uh, reception in terms of its tone and, and comedy is mixed, I think this is an area I especially think people are being over dramatic in because I think it overall worked and fit the energy to a T. There is nothing wrong with Mario being lighthearted, energetic, and simple because that's what Mario is. That's what Mario's games are like. That's what Mario as a character is like. Like he's not gonna be dark and serious and brooding and not having, you know, fun lighthearted moments because, well, that goes against what Mario is. And even when we do have those fun lighthearted moments and comedic moments, there's no fart jokes, no low effort potty humor jokes, no random dance party stuff, no pop culture reference spamming, no over reliance on quipping and meta jokes. It has none of those annoying tropes that are in so many other recent movies, yet people say that this movie is obnoxious and childish and it doesn't have any of that stuff. So it just makes me absolutely confused. Like yeah, this movie has some hit or miss humor, but I feel like people are really just over dramatic about it. I feel like people just look for things to like antagonize when it comes to the tone and humor. I think overall the tone and humor was on point. It didn't have any of that annoying stuff that is in <coughs> certain other video game adaptions. So yeah, I feel like people are kind of being over dramatic there. This movie feels less childish than some recent movies for older audiences. Which on that note, I guess I can get into something I really want to talk about before I give my final summary and verdict for this movie, which is comparisons with the Sonic movies. I figure I might as well tackle this while I'm sitting here rambling off a miles a minute. I should give my comparisons to the Sonic movie right now because I don't want to annoy y'all by making constant comparisons between this movie and Sonic in the future, so I figure I give my thoughts on it right now. How do I think this movie stacks up to the two Sonic the Hedgehog movies. And I'll tell you one thing for sure, and y'all shouldn't be surprised by this, this first Mario movie by Illumination is better than the first Sonic movie 
by miles. Yeah, that first movie and even that second movie are better paced than this one. Like, I think that's the main advantage they have on this Mario movie. Obviously, because of how fast paced and energetic this movie is, it, it definitely makes it a bit more hard to watch sometimes than the Sonic movies, which are a bit slower. But the problem with these Sonic movies is that they can be too slow. Like, I feel like the fact that this movie is so fast paced helps it in some ways because this movie never feels like it's wasting a scene. Every minute of it feels like what a proper Mario should be. And not only that, a lot of the scenarios that this movie has are generally entertaining to watch. Like I've seen some people say that this movie is boring in too many areas, but I just disagree with that completely. I feel like for the most part, every scene of this movie has something to offer. As to where with the Sonic movies, you have countless moments and scenes that are a drag to get through because of how hard they try to be trendy or how they scale back the tone and energy of scenes just to be safe for those general audiences. Between the Fortnite dances, the overall just dance party scenes, the fart jokes, the constant pop culture references, like that stuff tastes my patience immensely when it comes to these Sonic movies. And don't get me started with the music comparisons and the sales comparisons because those definitely aren't even close. We ain't even gonna talk about those, but yeah. Despite this very heated comparison, like that's just how I feel. Like overall, I think that first Mario movie is way better than the first Sonic movie. And because of how annoying those elements get even into the second Sonic movie, I think the Mario movie is better than both of them. But... But if there's anything you're going to take away from this, do note that I do think those two Sonic movies and this Mario movie are good overall. In fact, the second Sonic movie and this Mario movie are even neck and neck in rating for me. But I just think that the way that this Mario movie adapted its source material should be the new gold standard for how video game movies adapt source material. Like, obviously it wasn't perfect because of how fast paced it was, because of how the character development falls apart in a few areas. But overall, this should be one of the main templates for how to do a video game movie. It is a great movie, and I just think it handles certain things better than a lot of past video game movies. Like, I've seen some people try to say that old live action Mario movie is better than this, which if you say that, power to your opinion, but whew, I'm not taking you seriously. <laughs> I can't, bro, I can't do it. I can't, <laughs> I can't do it, but yeah. All right, summary and final verdict time. So overall, what do I think of this Mario movie? I know I've been going crazy just rambling about this movie, but we're almost at the end here, folks. What are my final thoughts on this Mario movie? Overall, I am going to rate this movie a very, very high B plus. And keep in mind, it is very close to an A for me. I really want to give this movie an A minus. Like, I really want to give this movie an A. But, you know, because of the pacing and some of the other issues I talked about, it holds it back from completely hitting that A tier for me. Like, while I do like this movie and think it's a great film, even if you aren't a Mario fan, there's no denying that without that Mario knowledge, it does become less enjoyable for you. And because of how messy sometimes the uh, pacing of this movie can get and how the development is just all over the place sometimes. It makes this movie not as tight and like perfect compared to some other movies out there. So overall, as a film, it's not perfect. But as an experience and as an adaption to the Mario franchise, I think it is a beautiful love letter that does deserve respect. Like the people that are flat out saying this movie is bad, or that it has no value beyond just being a Mario movie for Mario fans? I don't know, bro. I don't agree with that. I do think its few flaws and focus on being Mario-centric does not give it any less value. Because this movie captures what makes the Mario brand overall so appealing in a nutshell in scenarios that I do think are entertaining. And because of that, this movie does have value. So yeah, high B+, plus, super close to an A, super close to an A- minus for me. But 
I can't give it an A, you know, with those pacing issues, but do keep in mind it is super close to an A for me. It is like almost an A for me. And like the Mario nerd in me definitely gives it an A because I just feel like it did the Mario brand so much justice. But yeah, those are my overall thoughts on the movie. This movie is really good. It deserves like all the money it's making. And yeah, I can't wait for the future of more Nintendo movies. Which speaking of that, that gets into my final segment of this review, which is my future section. Talking about what I think the future around this movie looks like. And right off the bat, this movie is getting a sequel. 100% no questions. It made so much freaking money that it's not even funny. Like, it beat out Frozen 2 to become the number one animated movie in less than a week. It stomped out just the first Sonic movie alone in less than a week. The future of more Nintendo media right now looks brighter than ever. Like, and I do not say that lightly. Like, it's so funny comparing how this movie is performing in terms of sales compared to how the first Mario movie, that live action one, performed. Like, it's almost night and day. But yeah, we're definitely going to be seeing more Nintendo movies, maybe even more Mario movies and stuff like that. And it's definitely going to be really interesting to see. But that gets into what specifically I want to see next in terms of the uh, other Nintendo series. And really, I don't know. There's a many different ways that they can approach to doing more Nintendo movies. Like, they can obviously just continue the Mario movies and just do spinoffs and stuff like that. Or they can use this as a way to immediately branch into the other Nintendo series. Like, weirdly, there were some Nintendo series that weren't referenced in this movie. Like, I'm surprised we didn't get that many Zelda references. And maybe that's because they do indeed want to do this whole Nintendo cinematic universe thing. Though, it would be kind of weird if they dive into some of those other series like Kid Icarus and stuff like that. But I feel like it doesn't really matter all too much. Like, I still think they can do movies for those series and still kind of connect them. It would be weird, but they can still do it. Uh, like, right off the bat, like, I know, I know they're cooking that DK spinoff. Like, the way they emphasize the Kong Kingdom in this movie, I can just feel that they are cooking that Donkey Kong spinoff movie. And I better see King K. Rule as the villain. I do not want to see those freaking Tiki's. Snowmads, maybe if you do, like, a sequel to the Donkey Kong movie, I'll take that. But nah, I want to see the Kremlins on the big screen, bro. <laughs> but let's get into, you know, the Mario sequel, because obviously that's the most important thing to talk about in terms of the future of this movie. And obviously they tease Yoshi, so he seems like he's going to be a big focus in that next movie. And I think he definitely has some potential, like they could obviously loosely base it on Super Mario World, go to Dinosaur Island or Yoshi's Island or whatever they want to call it. And maybe they could travel to some other kingdoms that we either saw in this movie, but didn't spend much time in, or travel to some new kingdoms that we haven't seen yet. Which I definitely do think they need to do in a sequel, because I'm still really bummed that we didn't get to see much of some of the kingdoms that we saw in this movie. So I think what they should do in the sequel is use it as a chance to explore more of the Mushroom World. Get it? Mushroom World, uh, the Super Mario World, Yoshi, and uh, okay, I'll stop. But yeah. That's one of my biggest hopes for the sequel, like right out the gate, just to see more of the Mushroom World now that we got all the Brooklyn stuff out of the way, and I'll take some Yoshi shenanigans as long as he's not an annoying character. Like, I don't know if he's going to talk or not. Don't make him like how the Yoshi was in the cartoons. Please no, don't do that. But <laughs> yeah, strangely, I have a prediction for the next movie. Like, you know how I said that I predicted how the final battle of this movie was probably going to go? Strangely, they didn't go with the most overused Bowser final battle trope, which is Giant Bowser. So I have a strong feeling that either in this next sequel or in the sequel after that, we're going to see Giant Bowser because they just love doing the Giant Bowser trope. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's what they do in the sequel, especially since right now he's shrunk. So maybe when he like gets big again, he like gets so much bigger to the point where the characters have to figure out a way to defeat him. And obviously, there's room for all sorts of other characters, too. Like, there's a few characters that I'm definitely bummed out didn't show up in this movie that I would love to see 
in a sequel. Like, dang it, my freaking Sarasaland Fury was false. No, Daisy, why do you do me like this, Nintendo? <laughs> I also feel like they could have done something with Warrior and Waluigi, like give them a cameo during the Brooklyn section or something. I was surprised not to see them, but I guess I shouldn't be because, you know, Nintendo hates those amazing Mario characters for whatever freaking reason, but eh. Bowser Jr. and the Kooplings, I also think they definitely have some sequel potential. And fun fact, they actually reference Ludwig specifically because his name is on Bowser's piano while he's singing. And that's definitely interesting. That means the Kooplings do indeed exist, and they're definitely out there. I definitely think the Kooplings and Bowser Jr. could be easily like some interesting potential sequel villains. Or if they want to go in the exact order of the games, they could adapt. Super Mario Bros. 2 USA and, you know, get war and all the subcom shenanigans in here. That would be really great. Two characters I'm hoping we could potentially see, but I'm not holding my breath, is I do hope we get Toadsworth in there somehow. Like, I know him not being here in this movie alone kind of, like, kills our chances to ever see him, but I don't care. If it were up to me, I'd find some way to, like, get him in there because it's just so stupid he wasn't in this movie. It makes no sense, but I'm done ranting about Turd's Wolf. Um, and Paulina, I think they should give Pauline a bone too, because it's kind of sad we didn't see much Pauline in this movie. And I don't know if she'll ever really get a chance to shine since they kind of cut off a lot of her story potential. But yeah, you know, other than that, those are my big hopes for the sequel. Some people want to see Mario Galaxy stuff, like they're really disappointed that Lumily didn't do much. But again, I don't mind that they didn't go crazy with the Mario Galaxy stuff because, again, Mario Galaxy can be like a whole movie. I want Mario Galaxy to be the third movie, and I cannot stress that enough because there is way too much other Mario stuff to explore first before we like go into freaking space and have crazy space battles. So that's my take on that. Maybe some of you think that Galaxy would be great for the second movie, but that's just my take. Um, and I guess the last thing I'll say in terms of my future you know thoughts on what the future of this movie could look like is i hope we get like an extended edition of this movie that maybe helps like give it some extra meat like really tighten up this movie and make it a bit more well balanced in the pacing because again the pacing is that biggest flaw of the movie and maybe in an extended edition that adds back some of the scenes that were potentially deleted or some new scenes could help tighten up this movie a bit also if we get an extended edition, please add in the original music. Like, some of the mainstream songs maybe could stay. Like, again, I do like that No Sleep Till Brooklyn section. But, nah. Like, some of those songs just need to get added back in. Because it's so annoying how they went a little crazy with the mainstream songs. And cut actual OST songs for them. So, if we get an extended edition with deleted scenes. And that original music added back in. That might just be the definitive version of the movie. But that's just the pipe dream so i'm not holding my breath for that but yeah those are all my thoughts on the mario movie i thought it was a great movie i enjoyed it and that's gonna have to be the end of this review because i've talked long enough i feel like i'm done for today so yeah i'm done if you've made it to this point of the video thank you for watching all the way until the end uh what are your thoughts on the mario movie do you agree with what I thought about various things about the movie. Do you think I was too harsh on certain things? Or do you think I wasn't harsh enough on certain things? Let me know in the comments below. And be sure to leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel if you are new to it, and follow my additional social media such as my Twitter for more content and updates. This has been Nux, and I'm out. Peace.